most of us never realize as we stuff our faces with the sanitized swill of premium content providers is that there is a wealth of free entertainment just a few clicks away. While it is by no means the be all and end all of online video, there are approximately 1.3 billion YouTube users and 300 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every minute. In that great cesspit of screaming clickbait, it is easy for films to fall between the cracks, swiftly buried by an eternal stream of effluence. But what of those fallen and forgotten films, swept away and buried beneath the landslide of portly cats, facepalm fails and belligerent reaction videos? Strap on your favourite hazmat suit and join Indie Film Library as we take a deep dive into the internet's most popular video sewer. Journey with us as we rake through the muck, sifting through the turds in the hope of unearthing some diamonds for your viewing pleasure. Welcome to Tube Rats. Hello, and welcome to the fourth installment of Tube Rats, a bi-weekly podcast where we take a deep dive into the world of free online cinema to try and find something special in amongst the billions of videos cluttering up YouTube. This week, we're watching documentaries, and we've all seen some things this week that were difficult to watch, and not just in the sense of greed or the red room. There will be a huge tonal dissonance between the films covered today, because as we know, documentaries often deal with some extremely important and saddening topics. So before we go any further, I think we should probably flag up the fact that we will be discussing a film which makes graphic references to sexual violence. If you would like to skip that part, please pause and see the podcast description where we will have a timestamp you can fast forward to after good girls don't tell. Now with that said, joining me this week as always, faithful co-host Jimmy Rudiger. Jimmy, how are you keeping? Uh, faithful is a stretch but I'm happy to be here as always. I'm very excited this week because I, I've got one of my, my close friends and Norwich's answer to Captain Caveman joining us, uh, Jason <laughs> Overman. <laughs> Hello! Hello, I am a caveman it seems, despite the fact that I've never made fire. Never made anyone laugh either, but that's a different <laughs> story. <laughs> Fuck, I've lost it already. Um, it's going well. He is a good punchline in human form, it seems. <laughs> so he, by default, has made someone laugh in that case, Jimmy. Thanks for ruining my intro, Jack. Uh, I should ask, how, does, how was the film festival? Oh my god. Well, it actually went really well. Um, it was a technical nightmare for about a week leading up to it, but once that was all out of the way, it, actually, it went off without a hitch in the end. Uh, we selected winners uh, and announced them, um, the winners of which are currently playing on Indie Film Library still, but by the time this goes out, I guess they won't be, so disregard that. Also, it's, uh, it's good to see you again, Jason, because, um, yeah, it's been a few years since I've been back to Norwich now. I had a question for you um, before we get into things. Uh, as far as I understand, it was your idea to cover documentaries, and obviously I'm not, like, pointing fingers or anything. Uh, I found it an interesting choice for a comedian. Whatever was going to come up, there were chances that something not too fun was going to be discussed. I was wondering, then, why you wanted to tackle this particular genre. I don't know whether to blame the fact that there's a plague or the fact that I've done some pretty heavy work in non-comedy wise lately but literally all I do now is watch Drag Race and learn about horrible people like that's the only thing I seem to be interested in now I'm just constantly watching documentaries and listening to audiobooks about and occasionally I guess those two worlds will collide <laughs> whenever the Sherry Pie documentary comes out <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that oh that's, That's exactly what RuPaul hopes you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
I'm, I'm pretty sure that there would be one on RuPaul at some point because they aren't like uh, seem to be a horrible person. But... Frack, frack, frack away. <laughs> I have not checked this. RuPaul's into fracking. Uh, yeah, I think RuPaul's uh, husband has a, a fracking ranch or something like that. Please Google that. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, definitely the fracking thing is a big thing <laughs> that the drag community are trying not to talk about the moment. I like the idea of a fracking ranch because I'm just imagining fracking cowboys now. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it makes Red Dead completely different. Yes, riding a big old wave of oil. At all <laughs> okay, well... <laughs> Uh, this won't work remotely well as a segue into the first film. So, uh, without further ado, is it uh, Jimmy you're introducing Good Girls Don't Tell? does this person go to? Who does the victim turn to? Someone that won't possibly question their, the, the veracity of their statements. Um, also, and, and I'll get into this in a little later, but a rape isn't just of a woman's body or a man's body. It's also of their mind, emotion, and spirit. And so it's debilitating to come out of that when you're all by yourself after having been traumatized. Um, you question everything that you knew prior to the rape. You, you are filled with so much doubt that you even question whether or not reporting is a good idea. So well, the idea for Documentary Week, um, and I think I've done this quite well, is I wanted to pick one topic which was quite serious, uh, one topic uh, which was quite silly, and one film which was an overly pretentious attempt at being artsy. And Good Girls Don't Tell is our serious film uh, this week. Uh, so it's a 40-minute documentary uh, directed by Dr. Lindsay Brumel, who works as a senior lecturer at the University of London. So she's not really a filmmaker per se. Uh, she's a sort of professor uh, in the Department of Journalism. She lists her interests as uh, feminism, uh, digital news reporting, uh, and how the media reports on different events, so sort of the internal biases that the media will have whenever they're reporting. And Good Girls Don't Tell is, is, is a series of sit-down interviews with um, some reenactments with 10 young women who talk about uh, their experiences of being sexually assaulted or raped, in, usually by people very close to them, or co-workers, it's, very, it's a very powerful film. Um, it's only 40 minutes long, and it feels like a constant dread is a popular way I would, I would press it. Like, I came out of the film mostly hating everyone, and I'm, I'm sure you guys are going to feel quite similar. And it's, it's, I feel like the most disturbing thing is that, like, it's so obvious coming out of this, like, how common this is to young women. And I feel it's going to be quite difficult for us to discuss this as three men uh, discussing uh, 10 instances of women experiencing uh, sexual assault and rape. It's very, obviously, it's a very different experience to what we would typically have. But like the main thing that comes away from it is just how common this was for those women. So guys, I'm going to open it up to you, to you. What are your thoughts upon watching this? At one point in this, I shouted the phrase uh, fucking dickhead at screen at one of the the uh, perpetrators, uh, the description, because, yeah, it's, it's horrible. Like, it's absolutely brutal. And, yeah, it's one of those things that even, you know, we can't really understand, can we? <laughs> so it's like you're trying to understand what happens and we'll probably get told by lots of women that they know this this, these are things that happens and then we're just like oh shit we didn't know yeah I, I feel like the biggest takeaway for me is that, like this is one extremely common i think one of the statistics quoted was uh one in three women uh, experience rape or or on or you know attempted rape uh which is a sickeningly high percentage of people <laughs> And 95% uh, of women, I think I read, experience some form of sexual harassment on a regular basis. 
this did not fill me with sunshine and happiness when when I'd finished. I'm uh, I'm glad you got the elephant in the room addressed, uh, which is that we are three men talking about this. Um, there is stuff to talk about still from that perspective, um, particularly the stuff. Maybe um, as Jason said, we aren't the perpetrators directly. However, the film kind of partially touches on this idea that people, uh, men in general, are in some way responsible uh, through their everyday behavior. And I mean, what, what this prompted me to do was really to think about my past kind of like comments in, in a kind of comedic sense or whatever. And obviously that's the word, wrong word to use because looking back at things that I may have said or done, they weren't comedic. Uh, in particular, I made a uh, short documentary a few, like almost a decade ago now. And um, at the start, I, I played out this idea that I got kidnapped. And then there was this joke that uh, I got like brutalized by my, my kidnapper. And I, I have no idea what I thought was funny about that. And for some reason, it just it skated completely under my, my other sensibilities. Like, oh, if I'm the target, if I'm the punchline, it's fine. And it doesn't work that way because you're still essentially normalizing treating rape as a, as a joke, as a cultural commodity. This kind of film, I think, should prompt a lot of introspection in, in men in general, just about how they conduct themselves, even if they're not a rapist, even if they're not a perpetrator of, of sexual crimes, they are behaving in ways that may may suggest to other people this is this is the kind of a behavior that is acceptable. Like one of the things, so this this documentary reminded me of like two two sort of points I want to bring up. Yeah, and one of them is um, one of my own sort of like regrets. Now, it's actually it's a very big regret for me because I don't didn't realize what like a big deal it was at the time and it's sort of similar to yourself you know and I think you know realizing when you were younger that something well thinking something wasn't a big deal and la later realizing perhaps you should have acted differently yeah and uh one of the, the things this documentary reminded me of was um it was a few years back and uh, I was in a pub with one of my uh sort of female friends and a few co-workers and um a old gross man to put it nicely came up to my female friend, groped her on the bum, just leered at her, and then just walked away. And none of us said anything. And I think at the time, I was, one, shocked, because to me it seemed so abnormal. Well, to me it was abnormal. But also because I didn't, I was sort of so taken aback that that had happened. But I feel like when I spoke to her about it, she was shocked that we, like none of her friends, and myself included, said anything. But also she was shocked at like how often it seems to happen. I feel like as, as men, we don't understand perhaps how often this kind of thing does happen. And I genuinely regret now not having said anything at the time. It's genuinely one of my biggest regrets because that person's a very close friend of mine now, but I feel like I let her down quite a lot that day. And I feel like, I, like this film inspires a lot of introspection, as you were saying, about sort of occasions like that, where I think when we watch this, we're all going to, remember times when we feel like we should have acted or said something differently. Yeah. Um, the other thing this reminded me of was about a year ago, I was talking to one of my female friends about sort of how, you know, sort of her sexual experiences in the past. And what she confided in me was that she pro she's estimated that about sort of 60 to 70% of the people she'd had sex with, she didn't want to have sex with them but she'd felt either pressured or that it was too awkward to say no or something might go, in her words, go wrong for her if she did say no. Yeah. And, I mean, kind of hoped it was an outlier, but I, I sort of asked a few other female friends sort of similar things. And it's disturbingly common that some women will find it almost like, like expected to say yes because they're worried about what will happen if they say no. And there's not really a nicer way to put it other than, you know, it, it's sexual assault or it's rape, isn't it? And yeah. as, as three guys, you know, we, we can't really comment on this in the, with the same level of knowledge, but the fact that this happens under our noses 
so often. And I, I guess one of the things this documentary did was to to highlight that and to, you know, to make us sort of like think about all those instances. So yeah, it was a it was a very powerful documentary. It left uh, yeah, it left me and probably yeah, you said you, you as well. Like afterwards you were like, shit. <laughs> it just it took a while to recover from and like and you all say you're like, I shouldn't find it that difficult because obviously I've just watched some people talk about it. So what I've done is nothing, but you're like, holy shit, I can't believe that happens. And again, you feel like you should know better. In one of my, in one of my jobs, I work with young homeless people and I've supported so many people who have been through that. And even though I knew it happened all that time, I still was shocked. Like it's really difficult for, I think just a, a bloke to get that in your head. like. You think you need to constantly remind yourself to be less terrible. That's probably a good piece of advice. Um, <laughs> I think, um, yeah, the whole thing is really harrowing. Uh, a set of very meticulous uh, survivor accounts from sexual assault. And all of it, obviously, is really deeply disturbing. But one section particularly gave me some chills is... Um, not actually the the testimony there's a montage of online hate speech where people are repeatedly stating victims of rape are asking for it among a list of other sickening slurs um what really drove that home for me this idea that maybe and maybe we we are actually more exposed to this than we really think about maybe we've become numb to it what really drove it home to me was when I scrolled down to the comment section of this film, the comment section is closed and the like and dislike buttons are closed, suggesting that there probably was some kind of like orchestrated attempt to discredit or undermine this film by a portion of the YouTube community. Something about this kind of like uh, modern truism really irks me. This pe thing people often say when they're trying to act kind of worldly and wise on the internet is they say don't ever go into the comment section you won't like what you find are we essentially bequeathing the comment section to people like that i think it's very difficult because so in terms of like a comment section being disabled this reminds me of i'm not sure if you two have um i've heard there's a, a documentary filmmaker called anita sarkeesian who yeah. did a lot of um, like documentaries about feminism and video games. And the gamer community is not the most mature, to put it mildly. The vitriol she received for suggesting that some video games were sexist, uh, had outdated tropes, just the most basic Super Mario rescuing a princess from the castle is, is kind of evidence of that. But like this, like her comments and death threats and rape threats and everything she received to a point where she had to go into hiding at one point because of the, the vitriol she was getting. Yeah. Um, it's really difficult to like to police those comment sections while accounts and everything are essentially anonymous. I think in in South is it maybe South Korea you have, like for internet accounts or um, certain accounts you have to link your social security. Uh, yeah. information to them which although it does seem kind of like a, a nanny state solution it does at least take away that kind of anonymous nature that people feel perhaps that they can say what they want without fear of consequences yeah i mean the other the other problem with that is probably that if there's a data breach of facebook or whatever then suddenly every hacker and his dog has your social security information but there is something to be said for that sure yeah like it's one of those things you like i know it we shouldn't have to do it but then you're like oh it's just yeah it's a really sticky subject to get into and it's just horrific is there um do you think something to be said for some kind of collective action uh, again of users against things like uh, google or facebook or instagram because obviously one of the things that's come up related to, to either this or I suppose like the cases of uh, racism targeted at uh, footballers in the Premier League and so on. The criticism kind of stops at Google aren't going to do anything. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to ask Google to do things. 
but um, these companies are basically getting rich and fat off your data. You are providing them a service that enables them to get profit. And if enough people were to withdraw that, even temporarily, it would be a big problem to them. Is there some kind of is there some kind of uh, Facebook strike you could take part in, <laughs> something like that? I think the difficult thing is that a lot of people, you know, if you were to ask them, might say, "Oh, yeah, this is a great idea." What those comment section prove is actually a lot of people have these kind of views and enjoy being able to make these yeah. kind of like offensive or um, you know racist or sexist or, or horrific comments without that fear of being caught. I think it's it's really difficult. And I mean, the other thing is without defending corporations. It's a very, very big task. You think that if if a lot of people have like a Facebook, say an Instagram, a Twitter, uh, a YouTube account, and so if, if one person has four accounts and some people upload multiple times a day, some people don't, but you're talking hundreds of millions of accounts, how do you essentially police that realistically without you know having an, a whole army of people? Oh, well, I mean, they do eff effectively police it for other things, such yeah. as uh, brand placement, nipples, that sort of thing. <laughs> and they run it by algorithm, uh, which obviously is a system that gets plenty of critique of its own. But it's it's not something that you would literally have to employ a fifth of the world's population to solve. So, like, while it is promoting another podcast, um, Behind the Bastards had a thing on... I believe it's behind the bastards anyway, or might be been last year ever, had one about Facebook. And apparently for, I believe it was, it was like, uh, I think it's Eastern or Western Africa. They had like eight people for all of it. Oh, yeah. Wow. To like deal with the main issues. And I wish I could remember the name of the person who wrote the, report she used to work for facebook and said you know just how horrible it was because she had to like the algorithm would, would tell her certain things saying you need to look at this this looks like it's needs to be checked over by a person they look at it and then have to make a decision of whether she's got time to look into it you know and then you sort of see what's happened in i think it's ethiopia and myanmar with it's made it easier to <laughs> for people to victimize people of certain race or tribe or religion mm. it's that thing of how do we it's become so entwined in everything you do like as a comedian like facebook is one of probably the best way of getting people yeah. to your shows so if you want to do something in like the public eye i imagine it's the same with indie film library if you want to yeah. get your your content out there it's the best way to do it but also it's a shit company. <laughs> yeah. It's the same with, with Amazon. Uh, it's that thing of you really don't want to use them and you try not to, but sometimes it's a lot cheaper and you can't afford to go to a, a local run shop or you don't have time to run down to the... Or we're somewhere. in a lockdown and a pandemic yeah. and the local yeah. run shop isn't even available and yeah, exactly. has, hasn't been for over a year now. In those cases, I think you should always try and find a way to give some kind of solidarity to the people who are unionising at Amazon, I think. Yeah. They're probably the only people who actually do have the power to make any kind of change at how shitty that company is. Yeah. But I think we should probably digress here and go Stop back to angry. talking about the film. <laughs> so, on a technical basis, let's just talk about this for a second. Do you think that the use of actors to deliver the real life testimony uh, worked for you? Was or did it feel, I don't know, genuine? I think for me it felt genuine just because it, it you know, what we were hearing was still actual sort of sexual assault survivors telling their stories. Yeah, I think for me it was a really the way it was done, sort of like with multiple cameras and the reenactments was a really good way of keeping keeping i don't want to say engaged because i like in no way was just like a boring watch or no. something but I, I for lack of a better word I, I guess engaged because to watch 40 minutes of just straight interview i think would be quite difficult and i think this it, it was done really well and it was also done very tactfully it wasn't sensationalized in any way which i think 
is something that, you know, obviously I want to avoid massively. I think it, for me, it was done really well. I put down, like, it was a, a little rough around the edges, but, you know, it looks like they were concentrating on the, the content more than than the rest of it like yeah so some of the actors maybe you know not gonna win an oscar for what they're saying but they they were there to do what they did which was engagingly tell their story and that's yeah. what they did i think to give them the benefit of the doubt as well i'm not entirely convinced they were actors per se as they were volunteers yeah um in the same way that um although this is a very engaging and like powerful documentary um, the director wasn't really a filmmaker in that I don't feel that she's got a whole plan for a, another film in the future. Yeah. Um, it um, it so could be that they're students in that case. From what I, I gathered from like the credits and from trying to do a bit of research on, on sort of the director and the subject, I think it were volunteers in the department that Dr. Bouma worked in as opposed to sort of people they'd hired. Yes. Yeah. They were... Um pretty good by those standards i think they were just on the right side of the line where they were some of them were you know acting more overtly than others but it was it never it never crossed a line into being kind of hammy it was always it was always completely appropriate i think yeah and you you had the feeling that some of them were telling someone else's story but then like you couldn't help but think oh are they talking about themselves as well even though you knew they're not mentally which kind of made it even more horrific yes and also just the the pop-up stats uh that just emerged on the screen at certain points initially i was thinking uh, maybe this like there's one that says someone is sexually assaulted in the u.s every 107 seconds and i was feeling maybe that should be at the start but then i start to think about it like the last thing that you want in this kind of documentary is for your audience to get comfortable and to kind of be able to sink into a rhythm of what they're expecting to see and these horrible stats just come up and kind of stun you back into the room again yeah i would definitely agree with that because there were a couple of times where you think like i say you it's so horrific and you kind of do feel a bit numb to it and then it it did pull you back in i was just thinking like in another way though isn't that kind of almost demonstrating the fact that these sort of statistics which should be really horrifying and just kind of sort of in there almost as a kind of normal part of the film as though there's nothing special about them it's like indicative of how common it is perhaps mm. um whether or not that was like a stylistic choice or whether or not like that's just coincidental but the sheer fact that like these horrifying statistics are just peppered in is kind of like sort of similar to how this horrifying thing happens to women all the time it's just almost like an everyday, you know, part of everyday life. So maybe I'm looking too much into that, but... I think uh, that it, it's entirely justified that we, we talk about stylistic choices like that and maybe do try and read into them. I think I have to say, uh, Dr. Lindsay Blumel, she really did a hell of a job on this. And I wasn't necessarily expecting that because having studied, um, studied in a film department before, most academics are not natural filmmakers to put it bluntly and when they do attempt it it uh, often comes across as quite dry data-driven kind of stuff that uh, isn't particularly emotionally effective and obviously this had a huge impact on us just you know from the way we've all reacted to it it's, it's obvious that this was a very powerful film i think we've all sort of privately said to each other that we were horrified and um even though she's perhaps not a a filmmaker in sort of a traditional sense is clearly quite talented at what she's um she's done i feel yes so um with all that being said in that case would uh, would we recommend this film difficult there like definitely but also uh, <laughs> it's it should be watched but also it's it's hard to watch i fully agree i i would recommend it with the caveat of it's a very upsetting and very difficult watch, but it's worth a watch. So, I, yeah, I, I would recommend. Yes, I think I'm with you there. Like, uh, a recommendation with a, a trigger warning preceding it uh, would be appropriate, but it is definitely something that people um, who, can, who can watch it should watch it. We should probably close this one out with um, 
if you cannot convince a fascist, acquaint his head with the pavement, is the famous <laughs> saying. <laughs> yes. An unbelievable 53 miles of shelving containing some of the oldest known books in existence, many of which haven't been seen in ages, and only a select few are ever allowed inside. The Vatican Secret Archives. It's one of the most tightly guarded and speculated about locations in the world. And uh, that brings us to our second film of tonight to be introduced by Jason, Secrets of the Vatican Archives Exposed. Thank you very much. Yeah, so Secrets of the Vatican Archives. It's a 16-minute documentary by the esteemed filmmaker and totally not a conspiracy theorist dick weasel, Jay Myers. It's currently got 31,000 views, and this channel has 20, uh, 223,000 subscribers, which I really hope he paid for, because it's terrifying otherwise. So yeah, this is, uh, it explores the Vatican archives, and what is held in there. I'm, I'm trying to think of things to say about it. Um <laughs> From let's go for the the film itself uh, without talking the subject matter. It what my note says is it seems to be a, con a collection of presumably copyrighted footage, badly <laughs> mixed with stock images of spooky things, and narration that said people have once said this, so it must be true. <laughs> it was I, about five five six minutes into it. I thought all this needs is David Icke and it ticks all the boxes. And there he was. Like, <laughs> it, oh, it was, oh, I don't know. It, it was just, it was a mess. They were, he just threw so much information, all of the, everything which came with. People have said, <laughs> rumors are. <laughs> I feel like when you said documentary, I feel like you had your fingers up doing that little mini quotation marks. Oh, I, I did. Yeah. I did. <laughs> call this a documentary in the same breath as the, the previous one we've discussed is. Yeah. <laughs> it's a stretch. Uh, <laughs> all I'll say for this one is that um, it was 16 minutes of film for approximately... I'd say 20 seconds of content. Yeah. <laughs> there was nothing there. Like, the, the whole point was that the Vatican has a library and no one really knows what's inside, including apparently the Vatican. Uh, I, think, <laughs> I think the film is summed up in the greatest quote of all time, which happened by someone who looked a bit like uh, Richard Attenborough in Jurassic Park that said, I don't know what's in the secret arch archives. It's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> Just, oh, it was so beautiful. Life finds a way. <laughs> I watched this a couple of times because like, one of my hobbies is seeing like weird ass conspiracy and right wing bullshit mm. and seeing what what are the Nazis doing. <laughs> yeah, you need to you need to know what the Nazis are doing to stop the Nazis. And this was a, like that moment where the whole New Age hippie, slowly you see it when it's yeah. like saying the Vatican. And there were so many things you're like, oh, it's so close to being horrifically racist. But it's... <laughs> you, you peel back all the layers with that kind of <laughs> New Age hippie type. And then once you've got through the outer layers of the onion inside is a horrible shriveled anti-Semite. Yeah. <laughs> He's my like, machine, the man now. <laughs> it's like the second they mentioned David Icke, and you're like, ah, oh, yes, when you say lizard, we know what you actually mean, David. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a niche, niche David Icke fact. I know. It's, it's, ever since I found out that his entire career was two years at Hereford, just made me so happy. And yet, if you go on Wikipedia, it comes up and says he's a footballer. 
I guess it says the same about Gordon Ramsay, though, and by all accounts, he, he wasn't really that close to making it big, so... <laughs> I mean, I, what I wanted to say about this film, I think I came from a kind of similar standpoint to Jason. I have to, I have to confess that I've always been a sucker for documentaries of this ilk. Not, not so much like right-wing conspiracy videos, but like I like the, the nonsense that you'll find late night on the history channel or, yeah i mean on youtube there's so much to see like there's the whole collection of leonard, leonard nimoy's unsolved mystery series um at one point he suggests bigfoot is watching us for signs that we're mature enough to reveal himself to us <laughs> there's there's animal x which is this fabulously hokey series on youtube where witnesses and that's in inverted commas <laughs> They they claim their names are things like Michael Jackson and John Lennon, so they, they you know they really want to be on on record saying this stuff. Uh, they recall the time that they saw a demon dog while they weren't wearing their reading glasses. Jimmy, if you can edit in here a clip, I'll send you the specific clip. But it's this old woman, and she sees Black Shuck, uh, the demon dog. When I first saw it, it was it was just like a retriever dog you know, black retriever dog. And when I went to get hold of it, to take it home because the boy was deaf, that just went small. I couldn't touch it. When I went down to get it like that, that, that just went like a, a, a cat. And I stepped back, I was frightened. More than 60 years on, Mrs. Bartram still won't venture out alone at night. She fears the phantom dog could be out there somewhere. And it went all small like a cat and run off. <laughs> so it clearly was a cat. In this <laughs> regard, I have to... <laughs> oh, I'm going to be okay, don't worry. I'll be fine. That's, that's fine. I don't often get a laugh like that. I have to say, I came away from um, Secrets of the Vatican Archives exposed a little disappointed, though. Um, the director, as you said, just assembled other people's footage uh, of crackpots giving History Channel interviews. And, and then some splice. of them had the History Channel logo still on mm. there. Like, mm -hmm. at least remove the watermark. Uh, Mr. Myers, you did not make this film, really. No. Um, <laughs> there's one moment, as you mentioned, where suddenly the movie starts quoting David Icke, and I thought to myself, Jesus Christ, the mescaline is kicked in in the middle of backcountry. But then <laughs> <laughs> the film just... The film just treats it as another academic source and quickly moves on. It's like such a damp squib. Like, I thought it was really going to go Fruit Loops for a second, and it, it really doesn't. So one of the things that I, I don't quite understand, um, and you, know, you can see through your comment section, it's full of sort of like conspiracy nuts that are all convinced that the Pope has got a secret library of all the secrets of mankind. Mm -hmm. But... What secret, essentially, are they expecting to find that would change the world that drastically? Hashtag well, Jeffrey Epstein knew. Was, was well, that a secret? That, <laughs> I was going to mention that because there was a comment from EVE-3 one month ago that says Jeffrey Epstein is also hiding there alive and, well, as a top relic. Uh, David Everett said he would not be surprised if the Vatican houses Satan himself. I mean, all I think you're going to find is probably a load of recipe books that, like, the Pope's grandmother wrote, and he refuses to share at this point. I really I don't think there's, like, anything down there that would have any realistic, like, big impact on today. Uh, I can't remember what the uh, relic is called, but there's a, a relic from Rome which they were like, oh, that's so cool, like, this, it, it's all in one piece, and it tells us about Rome, and all it is is, like, a list of what things, how much things cost, like, <laughs> so I imagine, like, it'll probably be really interesting to, like, someone who studies uh, theological history, and some of the history of the church. I thought that's you were going to say like, someone who studies shopping lists is going to yeah. find that really <laughs> interesting. Well, apparently, I do remember that the most expensive thing was a bale of purple cloth, and that was because the only person who was allowed to buy it was the emperor. That's so the one thing I remember. There was one moment that uh, I think summed up how kind of poor this film was, or how how much of an anticlimax it was, and it was like 
when the filmmaker clearly realizes that everyone is thinking to themselves, hang on, if the Vatican doesn't want people to have this information, and these are the only copies of the book, why haven't they burned them? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. I forgot about that. And then the, the documentary addresses the satanic Bible. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, you would think this is the sort of thing, the knowledge that you want destroyed so that Satan can't come back. And uh, apparently it just conveniently cannot be burned. Also, um, the source, I decided, you know, that was quite intriguing. I was like, oh, they're talking about this at Grand Grimoire. How cool is that? Yeah. So, um, and the source he quoted is the top um, result on Google. So that little <laughs> quote he put on there is the top result. <laughs> it's so, didn't so, even, like, pretend, like, scroll a few pages in to find something else. Essentially, you've done as much research as this <laughs> filmmaker has on point. <laughs> yep. <laughs> And it doesn't even say, it literally says, some people say, that whole thing. Oh, God. I, I guess, would we recommend the uh, <laughs> secrets of the Vatican archives exposed? Maybe? <laughs> like, no, definitely not. But also, no. if you love really shitty, like Jack said, late night History Channel documentaries, it's kind of fun just how terrible it is. But don't go out of your way to watch it. If it comes on, maybe watch five minutes and turn it off. Don't give them any views, though. Oh. <laughs> I think uh, I would say, actually, more, I'll draw a more severe line under this. I won't recommend it. Um, <laughs> again, I will say, if you are into that sort of thing, please check out Animal X and the subsequent Australian series, Animal X Investigates, where an aging English actor sends some Australian pseudoscientists across the world in search of Bigfoot. <laughs> And at one point they have a thermal sensor camera and they see something that they believe must be the size of a, a, a bear in the distance. Uh, and then the next day they walk over to where they saw it and they find out that it was actually just really far away rather than big. <laughs> and it was, it, was, it was the size of a duck. <laughs> so please go and see Animal X in all its glory. So I now take back my recommendation. Say, do not watch this. <laughs> go do what Jack said, because that sounds incredible. I mean, I'm going to say don't watch this purely because there's going to be a million other better documentaries that actually did their own research and spoke yeah. to people themselves. Yeah. <laughs> if you really want to watch a, 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 you know, a, a conspiracy theory, there's oh, better oh. ones out there. A bit warm today. I'm going to go to one of my favorite coffee shops, which is uh, the Perk. It's called the Perk Downtown. And yeah, we'll just see what kind of B-roll I can get as I walk down there. Oh man, I almost forgot you guys. <laughs> Okay, I think that brings us on to our third and final film in that case, which I will be introducing. It's called A Day in the Life of a Documentary Filmmaker, 2020 by William Seth Johnson. So yes, here's what I thought of this. A Day in the Life is a six minute colostomy bag of futile squawking <laughs> and vacant imagery in which a social media homunculus details his hectic schedule of typing nonsense while sitting in Starbucks and planning on ruining nature for the sake of his own vanity. <laughs> uh, on, on the surface, it's an excruciating sequence of B-roll collected by the survivor of the world's first personality amputation. <laughs> But it is the kind of footage that could be taken up by another filmmaker to extract a deep and terrifying meaning about the inescapable yawning void that awaits each and every one of us. Uh, it makes me want to paraphrase Werner Herzog uh, from Grizzly Man. Um, what haunts me here is that in all the faces of all the beings that I see in A Day in the Life, I discover no kinship, no understanding, no mercy. I see only the overwhelming indifference of cretins. <laughs> to me, 
there is no such thing as a secret world of William Seth Johnson, and his blank stare speaks only of a half bored interest in feeding his ego. That's that's my summary. It it was utterly <laughs> enraging. Oh, it was, yeah. <laughs> so my entire notes I've put on this is one. Didn't wear a mask in the shop. He's a dickhead. It was late September. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, September last year. We are all wearing masks. Wear a mask. Two, he can't sit down properly. Like, why is he always putting the camera in weird places and then, like, sliding towards it? And that's not how people do things. And three, fuck off. Like, that was my entire <laughs> note. Like, don't chuck I, I, God, I don't know if I've ever hated someone as much as I hated him, and I don't know why. I just, oh, it, it made me so angry for, for no reason. I don't think it was necessarily for no reason. Oh, I yeah, mean, true. <laughs> was, the fucking yeah. tree bit. Oh, wanting to cut a tree down because he can't see some mountains. Look around the fucking tree. Oh, that is the tree. <laughs> a perfect summary of the empty black void that is his heart i feel like you know <laughs> this this man who's whose whole life is now slowly being geared towards like accruing clicks so that he can <laughs> scrounge advertising of revenue on youtube or social media that's he doesn't care about anything else oh is there a tree that's blocking my view of the mountains cut that shit down <laughs> i i th think that the infuriating thing that got to me and possibly you about it was that if you go into documentary filmmaking, you should have a story to tell, a message to impart or a subject to champion. And a collection of aesthetically mediocre shots isn't a stand-in for that. There are millions of films out there which are better documentaries, but will probably never reach an audience because they're flooded out by dross like this or secrets of the Vatican never <laughs> exposed. I, I try and have a an active YouTube channel, but sometimes, especially in the last year with lockdown, it's very hard to find inspiration um, to, to record anything because, unfortunately, there's just not a lot going on. Each day kind of has, has blurred into the next for the last sort of 12 <laughs> months. But I guess the main difference between myself and William Seth Johnson is that on those days, I just don't film anything. <laughs> there's, there's nothing for me to say. <laughs> So I just don't say anything. I understand that, um, you know, that there's no, there's nothing to do. And I'll just try and give him the benefit of the doubt, perhaps more than, than you two who quite clearly hate this man with every fibre of your being. Yep. I feel like what maybe he's trying to do is, you know, as a, as a budding filmmaker, he's practising and honing his crafts. And um, there's, there's not a lot of redeeming quality here. Unfortunately, the dog was nice. Yeah, the dog was nice. You got to see a dog. That was quite I nice. Got to see a Starbucks, which I haven't seen for a year as well. <laughs> to be fair, I think um, I think the only thing that I have to say that would be positive about this 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 fellow is that he's he's not a su successful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because really, he's he's no worse than the wretched bloodsuckers on these sites who are trying, you know, trying to present themselves as successful as, as possible, uh, while actually probably like, uh, driving around in a rental Ferrari, giving a kind of crib style analysis of a, a rented apartment that they had for a holiday home or something and being like, this is our life every day. Won't you please give me your products to sponsor? I have such a reach. He's obviously, he would, he seems like he would like to do that. And I mean, I've gone to his, YouTube page to see for myself. There's reams of content on there that are about him rock climbing, uh, rock climbing, vacationing with his girlfriend, who the thumbnails seem to suggest is about seven different actresses, each paid to look like he has something going on. Uh, you know, it's it's contemptible, but it doesn't come with, say, the baggage that a Logan Paul has, where he actually has a lot of followers now. He has a lot of clout, enough to get on fucking WrestleMania this year, which I threw up in my mouth about, let me tell you. So there is that. There is that grim, po uh, that little positive. But apart from that, um, the trees here are in misery and the birds are in misery. I don't think they sing. They just screech in pain. That is my Werner Herzog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this was, this was a trek to get through. Um... It did leave me with one big question, though, is what 
is his job and why can't he walk his dog more? Uh, yeah. It's rental. Rental dog makes perfect sense now. <laughs> You've cleared it up. Good job. He can't <laughs> afford a dog that nice. That, yeah. Who can? It was a very nice dog. It's difficult. I am trying to find a bit of information uh, about him. As, as always, with trying to do a bit of background research. His Instagram says that his job, he's a video creator, a documentary filmmaker, and a Christ follower. Oh, good. I was really worried you were going to come back with something like, oh, he is one of the leading lights in the Make-A-Wish Foundation movement or something <laughs> like that. And I've just been horrible to him. But no, it's, it's fine. Fuck that guy. If he was well, a leading light in Make-A-Wish, then my only wish would be to turn my life support off. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, he's a Christ follower. That's a difficult job to get. There's only 12. He must be old as fuck as well, so I guess he looks good for his age. Yeah, that's a good point. Maybe he should be interviewed by the uh, by Jay Myers for the next Secrets of the Vatican. He knows what's down there. <laughs> he was down there. He was in Alexandria when the library burned. Stop oh. the cover-up. <laughs> Oh, there's a lot of. I mean, I've just, I'm just clicking through one of his other videos. There's a lot of Jesus in this, guys. A lot of Jesus. There's a Dear 2020 video, which is basically just um, the crucifixion, and also some forest fires. Wait, what? I didn't click on that. But the Dear 2020 one, I thought was going to be like an essay where he's like, "It's been a bad year, but we'll get by." But you're saying he crucifies himself? <laughs> so um, there's about forty. Well, even less than 40 seconds of various news clips of um of 2020, mm. followed by a minute and a half of just Jesus, uh, I, I assume taken from some film, just being crucified. <laughs> See, I think it, sounds, it might be Passion for Christ. It, it sounds like he could get work with Jay Myers. <laughs> this is very violent for Instagram. I'm surprised this is still on here. Always look on the bright side of life. I'm gonna report it and ruin this day. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not talking you out of it, but you know. No, good job. I can, I can, I won't. I don't know. <laughs> Do we have anything else to say about this film? Because there's really so little in there to talk about. We, we've given us more thought than he has already, so I've got nothing else to say. Okay, so just for a uh, purely admin purpose, would either of you recommend this film? I would not. <laughs> <gasps> I tried to not say anything mean, but I still came across like a dickhead. I would like a refund on my time, <laughs> and I would not <laughs> recommend this. Jack, would... Um, would you recommend, or...? Hmm. <laughs> As I've said, we've we've seen an actual legitimate documentary at the start, which I recommended. This this is repulsive by comparison. It's an aberration of a film, and I don't think anyone should see it. It should be locked in the Vatican vaults, <laughs> along with Jeffrey Epstein, who uh, I, I assume is just living down there off like oh. crackers. Apparently, uh, rats. You mean biscuits, we're, we're, not white people. <laughs> right. I, he was into a lot of sick shit. Let's be clear. The bastard. Only Jacob's cream crackers, and there's no water. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, that's what we do with them. That's fair enough. That's, that's about right. I think he just yeah. has to live like that. <laughs> just the driest mouth ever. I did forget one great thing about the uh, secrets of the Vatican. Like, because while there are a lot of secrets in the Vatican that we need to discover, mm -hmm. something else that you also need to discover is Raid Shadow Legends. Oh, no. <laughs> the the paint, like, what was it? It, sounded, it was something like, you know what, isn't it a secret? <laughs> it was, I forgot about this terrible segue. It was beautiful. Listen, and, until I saw the first... Uh, tonight's first film and realised we're going to have to do a serious opening. I was planning on opening with an advert for Raid. Do you know what two-year-old your Pope isn't afraid to play with? <laughs> <laughs> oh god, yeah, so, uh, if I'm, uh, next time, next time, Jimmy, we'll make a, we'll make a cheap buck, because uh, uh, apparently 
these people will just sponsor any old shit as well. Like I feel like if if we make the advert and then just tell them we've done it, we'll probably just get paid. Yeah. yeah. We, can we be nasty about it as well? Most of the adverts are. <laughs> it's a great game. You get to do stuff. You don't. That's not some problem. <laughs> you should just pay money for the chance to do stuff. Ah, that's the dream. So, Jack, do you want to summarize or? I mean, yeah, it's an ac- it would be academic at this stage to ask which you thought was the best oh, film the of the connection. It would oh, yeah. be utterly pointless to ask, but please enlighten me, both of you. Well, to, to the grand surprise of no one, Good Girls Don't Tell is, is the one I would recommend watching out for free. Yep. Um, if you're high, you could maybe watch Secrets of the Vatican Archives Exposed. But even then, ultimately, you're just wasting your time. And at least after watching Good Girls Don't Tell, you're going to feel like you could perhaps grow as a person somewhat. Watch Good Girls Don't Tell. Don't watch the other two. If you need something terrible in your life, listen to Jack and watch, was it Animal X? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, that is true. Animal X investigates because you know, that sounds incredible, and I will watch that this evening. Yes, so I will send you a link later. <laughs> link, in the, link in the description, in fact. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> watch um, that instead of what we watched. You'll have a better time, <laughs> apart from the first one, which was required for you. Okay, uh, uh, yeah, I'll make it an, a unanimous uh, vote and say that obviously a Good Girls Don't Tell is the best film that we watched tonight, and uh, the others should be uh, jettisoned into space <coughs> in the direction of the sun. So I guess it just remains for me to thank both of this week's panel, uh, Jason and Jimmy. Jason, before we go, is there anything in particular that you would like to let our listeners know about coming up in your schedule? Probably not. Um, hopefully, later in the year, comedy will return. I will be back. There may be a special event with me and Jimmy doing fun stuff together. So um, keep an eye out if you're in Norwich. Okay. And Jimmy, do you have anything that you would like to plug this week? Uh, just as always, you can follow me on YouTube, where I'll every now and then rip a film to shreds or make a funny video where I insult Jason. And that's pretty much it. <laughs> Oh yes, please, please do visit Jimmy's um, Jimmy's YouTube this week because uh, he's just posted a delightful video where he examines Cats 2019 by uh, Tom Hooper. It's a riot. Um, and I guess for Indie Film Library, just a quick announcement, our uh, submissions are open again. So if you would like us to evaluate your film, probably in a much more constructive way than what's gone down here, please, Go to Indie Film Library. There'll be a big button that says submissions. Hit that and uh, send us your film. That's all said and done then. Um, uh, Tonight's episode was really an episode of uh, two halves. One big serious half that uh, we should all take plenty of food for thought from. And one half which was a horrendous experience in its own right, but for very different reasons. (laughs) Please do join us again for our next episode of Tube Rats in two weeks' time. Uh, In the meantime, I guess we'll play you out with some nice, calming music. Goodbye. Thank you for listening. Tube Rats is created, produced, and edited by Jack Brindelli and Jimmy Rodiger. As always, we'd like to thank Libby Irons for allowing us to use her music, and we'd like to thank Jason Overman for joining us. 